actually called Overcome, and it's inspired by the civil rights anthem, We Shall Overcome. Um, and it's really a, a conversation that's meant to take the dream of Dr. King and all of the civil rights leaders and um, people who, who, who've been before us and taken risks so that we can enjoy some of the privileges we have, uh, but also to recognize the work is not done and say um, very honestly and sincerely, what can I do to continue the work toward the dream? So this again is called Overcome.
I'm Peter Tyrellman. I had the good fortune in the summer of 1963, at the age of 19, to be a volunteer in SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee of the Southern Civil Rights Movement. I was enrolling for Mississippi in the summer of 65. Some of you have seen or will see the movie Selma, but today we're going to show about 13 minutes of the documentary, The Legacy of a Dream. You will see Martin Luther King Jr. in 1956 at the youthful age of 26, spearheading the bus boycott in Montgomery in Alabama. And in 1963, the voter registration drive in Birmingham. Even as a young man, King spoke truth to power. He did that based on the philosophy and belief, and also as a strategy to deal with institutional racism in the face of the power structure. We will see how he, st he stood up against the war in Vietnam and his concern about poverty and unemployment. The struggle for freedom and civil rights for black Americans has been going on since the time of slavery and continues today. Those of us who went to the Sojourner's Truth walking tour this morning learned more about Florence and Northampton and how they are part of that history. Our youth are the vanguard of civil rights efforts of today and tomorrow. And the value of the dialogue between youth and their elders is important. Um, those elders who were part of the earlier struggle. But I would like to add that those black and white who are on the stage of middle life were often caught up in their family and work lives. Our need, we need to be involved in the effort to end institutional racism. We need people of all stages and all ages. Let's now watch the video and see how Martin Luther King's exceptional leadership Remembering that others, such as John Lewis and Bob Moses of SNCC, and James Farmer of CORE, and Bayard Reston, and many others have played significant roles in the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s. And they've left plenty of room for us to get out there and do more work. Thank you. It had been a way of life for large parts of the nation, it was practically eliminated. Full freedom was not won, but more was accomplished in those 13 years than the previous 100, including the enactment of federal legislation to protect the rights of black citizens. Wherever, by clear and objective standards, states and counties are using regulations, or laws, or tests to deny the right to vote, then they will be struck down. Martin Luther King's leadership of this march toward freedom began in December 1955 in Montgomery, Alabama, in the heart of the Deep South. He was only 26 years old, a recently ordained Baptist minister who had been asked to lead a boycott of the city buses to protest segregated seating and mistreatment of black passengers. Are you ready for the question? All in favor, let it be known by standing on your feet. That was the day that we started a bus protest which literally electrified the nation. And that was the day when we decided that we were not going to take segregated buses any longer. And you know, when we planned the bus boycott, we said if we could just get about 50 or 60 percent of the Negroes of Montgomery not to ride buses, this would be an effective boycott. I think that whole day we found eight Negroes on the bus. And from that day on, that boycott was more than 99 and 9 tenths percent effective. We have a legitimate protest, and we feel also that one of the great glories of American democracy is that we have the right to protest for rights. We will do it in an orderly fashion, 
This is a non-violent protest. We are depending on moral and spiritual forces using the method of passive resistance. I, for one, under God, will die before I'll yield one inch to that kind of a movement. The die-hard segregationists and hooded hoodlums of the Ku Klux Klan reacted more and more violently, but the boycott was not broken. Murder, bombing, the jailing of Dr. King, none of these actions succeeded in weakening the determination of the black people of Montgomery. We still advocate non-violent or passive resistance and still uh, determined to use the weapon of love. For 13 months, people continued to walk and ride in carpools. Never before had a black community in the South banded together like this. Meanwhile, the legal aspects of the case were being argued in the courts, ultimately all the way to the Supreme Court. This morning, the long-awaited mandate from the United States Supreme Court concerning bus segregation came to Montgomery. I hereby defy ruling handed down by the United States Supreme Court, ordering desegregation of public care. This mandate expresses in terms that are crystal clear that segregation in public transportation is both legally and sociologically invalid. As long as I am president of the Alabama Public Service Commission, I'm going to see that our segregation laws are upheld. He neither could nor did, and the year-old boycott was called off. It is a great victory for the young minister and for the method of nonviolence. It is also the beginning of the civil rights movement in the South and led a few years later to the sit-ins and freedom rides of the early 1960s. Using non-violent direct action, mixed groups of whites and blacks, mostly students, challenged segregation on interstate buses and places of public accommodation throughout the South. The sit-ins and freedom rides were a new version of an old and respected American tradition, the right to protest for right, and resulted in the first attempts at federal civil rights legislation. The next target of the civil rights movement was Birmingham, Alabama, in 1963, the most segregated city in the nation, and for blacks, a place to die if you tried to be a person. I will not rest until we are able to make this kind of witness in this city so that the power structure downtown will have to say we can't stop this movement and the only way to deal with it is to give these people what we owe them and what their God-given rights and their constitutional rights demand. direct action meant a willingness to go to jail for one's beliefs in order to reveal to others the difficulties of obtaining justice. By committing acts of civil disobedience, the non-violent protesters forced the authorities to arrest them. In Birmingham, in the spring of 1963, the jails were literally filled by these methods. This, according to Dr. King, marked the non-violent movement coming of age. The arrests made headlines across the country and were televised around the world. You can never whip these boys if you don't keep you and them separate. You've got to keep the white and the black separate. Birmingham's police commissioner, Bull Connor, put non-violent resistance to its severest test with his brutal treatment of the demonstrators. The sickness and ugliness of racism was exposed to the entire nation and to the rest of the world as well by newspaper and television reports of his use of police dogs and high-pressure fire hoses. We must say to our white brothers all over the world who try to keep us down, we will meet 
pure physical force with soul force. We will not hate you. And yet we cannot in our good conscience obey your evil law. But we will wear you down by our capacity to suffer. In winning the victory, we will not only win our freedom, we will so appeal to your heart and your conscience that we will win you in the process. Birmingham marked another victory in the campaign to break down social segregation in the South. But equally important, it aroused the conscience of much of white America and brought recognition and support for the accomplishments of Dr. King and his nonviolent movement from people throughout the world. I have the great honor on behalf of the Nobel Committee to hand over to you the insignia of the Nobel Peace Prize. Martin Luther King was one of the earliest public figures to oppose United States participation in the Vietnam War. His outspoken efforts for the withdrawal of American forces often made him the target of furious criticism, even by other civil rights leaders. It was a difficult time for the man who had been called the moral leader of his generation. For those who say to me, stick to civil rights, I have another answer. And that is that I fought too long and too hard now against segregated public accommodations to end up segregating my moral concern. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Economic injustice was another kind of injustice. Before his death, Dr. King had begun to build a coalition of the underprivileged of various ethnic groups, the Poor People's Campaign, to fight for economic equality. It is my hope that power for poor people will really mean having the ability and the aggressiveness to make the power structure of this nation say yes when they may be desirous of saying no. We will get together and be together Black people, Mexican-Americans, American Indians, Puerto Ricans, Appalachian whites, all working together to solve the problem of poverty. We're getting ready to demand jobs and income. We're tired of working full-time jobs for part-time income. All right, all right. We're tired of living in run-down dilapidated, rat-infested shacks and slums. We are tired of our children right. having to attend overcrowded, inferior schools. And we are tired of our men not being able to be men because they can't find work. 1,300 sanitation workers on strike, and Memphis is not being fair to them, we've got to march again in order to put the issue where it is supposed to be. We have this illegal, unconstitutional injunction. All we say to America is be true to what you said on paper, because somewhere I read of the freedom of assembly. Somewhere I read of the freedom of speech. Somewhere I read of the freedom of press. Somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest for right. We have the right to protest for right. The right to protest for right. Since Montgomery, a constant refrain of the civil rights movement. Martin Luther King had always known that the right to protest for right rested on the most basic democratic right of all, the right to vote. 
As early as May 1957, after the successful conclusion of the Montgomery bus boycott, Dr. King helped to organize the prayer pilgrimage for freedom. Some 37,000 people, mostly church-going blacks, had assembled in Washington to voice their demands for full citizenship. This is the Supreme Court's decision of May 17, 1954. But it was to be eight more years before the realization of their demands and the passage of federal legislation guaranteeing the right to vote. Until then, black people throughout the South were forcibly prevented from registering and voting. Making them stand in the raid, keep them from registering to vote. And we will register to vote because as citizens of these United States, we have the right to do it. You can turn your back on me, but you cannot turn your back upon the idea of justice. You can turn your back now and you can keep the club in your hand, but you cannot beat down justice. And so in August of 1963, six years after the first pilgrimage to Washington, another larger demonstration took place in the nation's capital. People, all kinds of people, aroused by the police dogs and fire hoses of Birmingham, were exercising their right to protest for right. March on Washington was the greatest mass demonstration in the history of the nation. And it was Martin Luther King who underscored the urgency of the demands of the more than 200,000 people assembled in front of the Lincoln Memorial with his powerful appeal to the entire nation. Thank you, thank you for coming out uh, and welcome to AFC's Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. celebration. As usual, many thanks are in order, not only to those who are listed in the program, but to everyone who is willing and able to make today's events possible. As we are in their house, I especially wish to thank Reverend McSherry and the good people of Edwards Church. Uh, it is due to generosity and goodwill that uh, this day comes together so well. I want to also thank the, the folks who came out to the prior two events, um, beginning with the brave souls who came to the Sojourner Truth Walk, uh, and the always excellent Steve Strymer, uh, and to Dr. Power Green uh, his, and his program for children. Um, as for the former, we had a hearty crew of a couple dozen folks who walked the streets of Florence to, more, to learn more about the liberatory history of that area. Uh, and we will later pass the collection plate for District Attorney uh, David Sullivan, uh, who clearly needs a good pair of snow boots and a proper woolen hat on such a tree day. I've never seen anybody show up to the, the walk in Wingtons before. <laughs> before we talk about uh, who is here today and why we are here, it's important to know who is not. In the past year, this community lost many folks, um, but in particular, two good friends to AFSC, uh, Tim Carpenter and Bill Norris. Tim passed uh, last spring and part of early. Uh, he was an amazing man, so full of energy and vigor in a way that I've never seen anyone else. Most importantly, he occupied a narrow part of the peace movement. He was strongly principled, but able to reach across the spectrum of activists to the extent that he was able to get Medea Benjamin to join the board of an organization with the word Democrat in it. <laughs> he was a unique political organizer, and his launch upon the national political scene is more profound than most people know. We also lost Bill Norris, a steadfast volunteer with AFC. Most of you uh, may remember him from the AFC office in the Florida Community Center during the tenure of Joe Comerford. He was a fixture there, fielding calls and making happen the things that need to happen. I actually knew him before my time with AFC as a lawyer uh, to go to when we wanted to engage in civil disobedience at UMass Amherst. As a lawyer, he maintained the finest tradition of that profession, supporting the anti-war and anti-racist movements locally. He too is missed. I don't have a lot to talk about, uh, because this year so many people, particularly young people, particularly young people of color, have led the way, led the way with their activism to try to change our troubled world, uh, including women on our panel today. There's so much to say. In light of the disruptions by the Black Lives Matter activists, in light of the shopping malls that have been temporarily closed by activists in the past few months, and for the folks like the provocative souls who shut down traffic in Boston this past week. Right. I can't fathom 
Let's remember something from Dr. King. He said, you may well ask why direct action, why sit-ins, marches, and so forth. Is it negotiation a better path? You are quite right in calling for negotiation. Indeed, this is the very purpose of direct action. Nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and foster such a tension that a community which has constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. It seeks so to dramatize the issue that it can no longer be ignored. By citing the creation of tension as part of the work of a nonviolent resistor may sound rather shocking, these are King's words, but I must confess that I am not afraid of the word tension. I have earnestly opposed violent tension, but there is a type of constructive nonviolent tension which is necessary, necessary for growth. Just as Socrates felt that it was necessary to create a tension in the mind so that individuals could rise from the bondage of myths and half-truths to the unfettered realm of creative analysis and objective appraisal, so must we see the need for nonviolent gadflies to create the kind of tension in society that will help men rise from the dark depths of prejudice and racism to the majestic heights of understanding and brotherhood. The purpose of our direct action program is to create a situation so crisis-packed that it will inevitably open the door to negotiation. That was King. My final word is this, um, that I choose to live in this area because there is something different here than where I grew up. Dr. King addressed so many injustices in his life. In other years on this day, we have focused on the wars that our, our country is perpetually engaged in, on economic injustice, economic justice, and in so many other causes that he took up. Today, we focus more on work to end racism. The Pioneer Valley, Northampton, is not immune from racism. The legacy of slavery, of segregation, and of racism still infects our society. However, one thing that this area is special, special is in its history of rebellion and resistance. What I have noticed about this community, which is different from all of the other places that I have lived, being a trans transplant here is that so many people are willing to talk about and speak against injustice. As a community, we need to celebrate, nurture, and to continue that tradition. We need to foster this powerful vein of activism in our community and open the way for these voices to be heard, and just as importantly, for progress to be made. And progress is being made. This past week, Human Rights Commission member Natalia Munoz called for a commission in the city to address racism. There's so many other ways that Progress is evident. So I thank all the panelists who we'll be hearing from in just a moment for being willing to participate in this conversation. May it be the beginning of the change that we need to make in this area, in this state, and in this country. Thank you. I'd like to invite all the panel members to come forward and take their seats. And before she sings, I just want to say, Marcy Thomes is such an important part of this community. She teaches uh, school in the Amherst uh, Middle School. Uh, she sings uh, in the Haydenville Congregational Church Choir. And whatever event her voice is needed, like when the Philippines was hit so hard by the hurricane, and we needed to do a fundraiser for the Philippines, she organized and, and sang um, at the First Churches. And so there's not an event in this community that Marcia will support. Um, we're so fortunate to have her here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, this was a very difficult song to write. I wrote it um, shortly after the decision to um, quit um, um, after the acquittal for um, the Trayvon Martin killing, I'm choosing that word, <laughs> of an unnecessary loss of life of a young man of color. And um, it haunted me for a while, and it was very difficult, very painful, so I put it down for a while. Um, and then I saw the documentary Fruitvale Station. And that very night, I stayed up till 2 o'clock in the morning to finish it. So it's dedicated to the memory of Trayvon Martin and to the souls and spirits of young people of color who sometimes don't have their voices heard, often don't feel that they are heard, and, uh, and to the family 
of Trayvon Martin and um, and many others whose love lives on. City Hall. 600 people were mourning and protesting the tragic shooting of Michael Brown, a young black man living in Ferguson, Missouri. And my heart was beating that night because black lives mattered to me. And I kept thinking of Michael Brown. 
Michael Brown is a baby being born into his mother's arms. Michael Brown going off to school and being in first grade. Kept thinking of his mother, his dad, his grandmother, his grandfather, especially his grandfather. See, I'm a grandfather. I'm a grandfather of a little boy here in Northampton, and he's black. His father is African American. His mother, my daughter, is white. But for me, for me, his skin color is a daily reminder of how beautiful black is. As beautiful as the black sky that holds the lights of millions of heavenly stars. He will be growing up on the streets of Northampton. You will see him running down from first churches, past Main Street, down under the railroad bridge, past the roost, past Pops, traveling towards the Bridge Creek School. Could he be shot one day on our streets? Can Ferguson happen here? Can Ferguson happen in Amherst or in Northampton? Let this panel be a starting point with this question as a way of exploring together how racism is embedded visibly and invisibly in every family group, every organization, every institution in our city and in every city and town in America. Vanessa, you led, uh, you spoke so beautifully that night um, when we were in front of City Hall, and then you led 600 people down Main Street all the way to the courthouse and all the way back. 600 people followed you down. Can Ferguson happen here? Uh, why don't we start with the chant then, since folks know that I like to chant, um, and we're here on Dr. King's day. Um, please repeat after me if you feel to do so. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. It is our duty to win. We must love each other and respect each other. We must love each other and respect each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. We have nothing to lose but our chains. This, this chant, um, are the words of Sister Asada Shakur, who is currently still in exile in Cuba. Um, so thank you, I wanted to open with Asada. <clears throat> I came here today because I also have a dream. More than a dream, I have a vision. I have an idea. This idea is a very simple one. It consists of freedom. It consists of equality. It consists of the idea that not only can we as black and brown people walk down the street without getting shot dead, but that the systems and ideology of capitalism and white supremacy that fosters such conditions where our deaths become normalized is abolished. To me, the question is not, could Ferguson happen here? Because it already has. No, I do not know of anyone who has been recently killed by Northampton police. But I think of my brother Ayub, who was criminalized for the dual sins of being black and Muslim, and who awaits in a jail cell. I recall my brother who was pepper sprayed, attacked, arrested, and charged for the crime of pulling out his cell phone to record the police in the public performance of their duties. I commend Northampton for recently signing on to the Trust Act and for supporting our undocumented brothers and sisters in their quest to move freely without fear of deportation, and I hope that it is in this path that we can continue. As my comrade and brother Dr. Chris Tinson is so fond of saying, Ferguson is happening to America. Ferguson, which I understand to be out of this jurisdiction, and Oakland and Brooklyn and Detroit and Ohio and St. Paul and Beverly and Springfield and Hartford and Tokyo and Paris and Hebron are not simply marching against the state sanctions killing of black and brown people. Rather, we are marching against the systematic illnesses that create the conditions for this reality. A reality that allows for black and brown people to be born with a target on our backs. It is the reality that while black and white people use drugs at the same rate, over 60% of people 
currently incarcerated in this country, which is currently detaining 25% of the world's prison population, even though it only houses 5% of the world's population, are black and brown men. And the fastest growing rate of people detained in jails and immigration centers are black and brown women. It is the reality that black households make on average 13% less money than white households do. It is the reality that there are virtually no jobs to provide a living wage in this country, and that you, if you are a convicted felon and have a mark on your Cory check, you will most likely be cut off from job opportunities that do exist, cut off from housing and education opportunities. And these conditions will potentially add you to the 60% recidivism rate that um, of formerly incarcerated people. It is the reality that continually and systematically criminalizes, incarcerates, kills, starves, misrepresents, and excludes black and brown bodies. And the reality that if you are black and a woman, queer or transgender, or have a disability or a different ability, your humiliation and death may go unspoken and unresolved. It is for these reasons that I am here today. It is for these reasons that we demand freedom, because in our reality, we are not free, and we know that we could be. We demand an end to white supremacy. We demand adequate housing fit for shelter of human beings, medical care, and schooling for our children. We demand an end to the school to prison pipeline and mass incarceration. And yes, we do demand that a person be judged by the content of their character rather than the color of their skin. We demand policy reforms and legislation that indict racists, stop and frisk policing and profiling, and the continued use of body cameras during all police encounters with civilians. <coughs> We recognize that the small town of Northampton cannot by itself change these normalized systems of oppression that allow black and brown people to be killed every 28 hours, but by ourselves, neither can we. If you care still about humanity, then you will stand with us in dismantling the destructive system of capitalism that has us all fighting over crumbs and fighting each other rather than building unity. Dr. King, when he started his Vietnam speech, said, I have chosen today to speak about the war in Vietnam because I agree with Dante's that the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who in a period of moral crisis maintain their neutrality. Do not remain neutral. Stand with us on the side of justice. Palante. Chinese, come on. And you can come up here if, you, if it doesn't sound loud enough there. Hello. Charnese is, is at Smith College. Um, she's been one of the leaders of Black Lives Matter at Smith College. And I don't know whether you were uh, involved in the student demonstration in front of John M. Green Hall during Vespers, but I would love to have you talk about it a little bit. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Sharni Shaman, and I'm a junior at Smith College. And, um, I am here on behalf of all the women at Smith College who feel invisible, and all of the activists at Smith College. So after the non-indictment of Darren Wilson, a lot of us felt the need to find support. And when we got back to Smith College, we found that the support that we thought would be there was not there. And um, that was very troubling to us, and it made um, a lot of us sad that um, the unity orgs and the professors that we thought would be there for us at this institution were not. So there was um, a moment of silence. It was called a walkout for, um, in remembrance of Michael Brown. And we went out in front of the campus center to have this four and a half minutes of silence and it was unsatisfying because it reminded us that Smith is not a place for us. It reminded us that we feel invisible as people of color in a space for not people of color. And that um, we are always complacent, we are always polite, and we are always quiet. So a group of women of color at Smith College got together because we said enough was enough. And we decided to take up space that we have not taken up. And we started with something called a brownout. And what a brownout is, is where black and brown people come together and talk about their feelings, we talk about change, we talk about how we are going to raise awareness on this campus, on this predominantly white campus. So the first thing we did was we protested. Now we did not protest Vespers. Vespers is a show, one of the biggest um, 
holiday shows on Smith campus. We did not protest the Vespers, we protested at the Vesper. And um, we just wanted people to hear our voices and we took up space and it felt great. And we were in the street and we were outside of Vespers. And at the last Vespers show, which they do not live stream, they live stream the first show, which we were also at protesting. At the last Vespers show, we were asked to come in and sing the freedom songs that we were singing outside in the cold. And that was greatly appreciated. And it was a very powerful moment for us to take up space in that place that we didn't feel we were wanted. And for the rest of the week, we did a bunch of different plans of action. We had die-ins at which a lot of my professors supported and came to, which I was very thankful for. And we, um, we planned marches. We marched all up and down campus during lunchtime, read out the names and narratives of people we have lost to police brutality, and then um, we did more protests throughout the week, and then we went to, we filled up two buses to go to the Millionth March in New York City, and um, it, meant, it meant a lot to us, and um, it was really eye-opening for us that we could, um, we didn't feel like on Smith campus we could come together and make a difference, and um, just coming together and putting our minds together, we did that and we're very thankful for that because now we are coming back this semester and we are going to make sure that everybody is aware and that we don't ever feel invisible or not wanted or like we're in a swarm of people who are better than us. So I'm happy to be here because Black Lives Do Matter and um, speeches I've ever heard. You made us cry, you made us proud, and you spoke truth to power. And we would love to have you speak today. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. I'm honored to be asked to be on this panel and to speak to you here today to honor the phenomenal legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King. He was brilliant, radical, righteous, justice-seeking, and he changed the course of U.S. history along with Bayard Rustin, Stokely Carmichael, Ella Baker, Malcolm X, Claudette Colvin, Fannie Lou Hamer, and so many other heroic black Americans from the 1960s civil rights era. I'm sitting here deeply grateful to Martin Luther King for his accomplishments in racial justice in this country and at the same time I'm pained by how completely and totally everything he critiqued and called for in the 1960s is still relevant and still in need of remediation today. This day about Martin Luther King Jr. needs to be primarily a black narrative. As writer, journalist, and radio host Esther Arma writes in her essay about the film Selma, white privilege routinely expects and so, and so often gotten a centering in black historical narratives. Well, since the Black Lives Matter movement is history in the making, and Dr. King's story is black history, let's let black folks and people of color in this country tell us their stories and explicate their meanings. Oh, yeah. call upon us to change the dynamics of racial privilege in this country, we white people, those of us who are white in this room, we need to listen and to take the steps people of color demand. So what can I offer to this event honoring Martin Luther King? I can talk about how we as white people, those of us who are white in the room again, need to work to dismantle white privilege in this society. That is to dismantle our very own privilege. One of the manifestations of this privilege is that the average white family has 13 times the net worth of the average black family, as Vanessa said before, and 10 times the net worth of a Latino family. This has far-reaching implications in terms of the resources we have access to, the investments we're able to make in our communities, and the institutions we're able to support. Our access to education is also divided along racial lines, 
with fewer than 47, less than 47% of high school graduation rate across the U.S. for black males versus a 75% graduation rate for white males. As a society, we will imprison almost one half of all black male children born today, while those who profit from prisons remain overwhelmingly white. These statistics both result from racialized structures of privilege and access in the United States and have enormous implications for the shape of power in this country. Any conversation on race must focus on white privilege, and it's our role to conduct that conversation and take the action to end our privilege. We need to challenge the power structures that benefit white people over black and Latino people and rich people over poor people in this country. We need to face our national hypocrisy that has fueled the racist history in this country, including how we honor Dr. King, whom our government declared a national symbol and sees fit to commemorate on this day but whom many can't to this day admit was assassinated by forces in that same government. <laughs> it's our task as white people to take stock of the individual and institutional racism in, each, in which each of us take a part, and it's our task to work to end it. It's our responsibility to reach out to people of color to offer our assistance in this movement to end the daily violence and brutality against people of color at our hands. So, more concretely, what can we do? I didn't expect such a big crowd. I um, also only have about four minutes to speak, so I can't tell you all the things that um, I've thought of. I've got some... <laughs> finish up here. Um, first of all, we need to be afraid not to be unpopular. If we start calling out all the racism we witness, some people don't like it, won't like it. We need to be proactive in our own families, our workplaces, our communities. As white allies, we can't limit ourselves to reacting only when people of color are subjected to violence visibly and publicly. We shouldn't have to wait for moments of crisis to act. We can go to places like colorofchange.org to learn about the different advocacy actions we can take at the national level and locally. Um, we need to learn about and lift up the Black Lives Matter narrative and movement. We need to work hard to get together, to get people of color into positions of power in our school systems, in our businesses, in our our state and national governments. We need to create local commissions here in Northampton, in the Valley, to explore and identify the institutional racism and white privilege that pervade our local system and institutions. We need to develop recommendations to make changes, and we need to do the work to make those changes. We need to remember the words of the great civil rights organizer, Ella Baker, from 1964. Until the killing of black men, black mothers, sons, becomes as important to the rest of the country as the killing of white mother's sons, we who believe in freedom cannot rest. People of color, indigenous people, and poor and working class people are fighting for racial and economic justice every day, not by choice, as should those of us who are white in this room, but because their safety, their well-being, their freedom, and their very lives depend on it. When I spoke on the steps of City Hall after the non-indictment in Ferguson, I spoke to my friend Yasser Munif, who calls for a politics of love to achieve justice. So it's only right that today I quote Dr. Martin Luther King when he said in a 1967 speech called Where Do We Go From Here? He said, I'm concerned about justice, I'm concerned about brotherhood, I'm concerned about truth. And when one is concerned about that, he can never advocate violence. For through violence you may murder a murderer, but you can't murder a murderer. Through violence you may murder a liar, but you can't establish truth. Through violence you may murder a hater, but you can't murder hate through violence. And I say to you, I have also decided to stick with love. 
For I know that love is ultimately the only answer to mankind's problems. Hate is too great a burden to bear. I have decided to love. I just want to end by saying black lives matter, brown lives matter, indigenous lives matter, poor and working class lives matter, and we need to work together, all of us, to keep communities of color safe, afford them equal access to all economic and educational resources and positions of power, and to end mass incarceration. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, Russ, um, when... Vanessa was leading 600 of us down Main Street after this rally and we circled around in front of the courthouse. Your police were amazing. Absolutely amazing. They basically took their cars and they encircled the people walking down Main Street and they protected them from all the cars that were trying to come down Main Street. And they sort of did like a ballet around the protesters and the people who were all in their cars trying to get to another part of Main Street. And they were just redirecting all the cars down every avenue that could take them towards 91 or up towards Holyoke. And they protected us all that night. No one got hurt. And when Sharnis was lying down on Elm Street in front of John M. Green Hall, they did the same thing. They simply immediately redirected the traffic um, off the all the side roads. And everyone was safe. No one got hurt. Every time, Russ, um, I've needed you, you have responded. Um, during the domestic violence that we experienced in this city when, when Yoko Kato had her daughter and her grandson become victims of domestic violence from their father. You and your police were so important to helping us deal with an epidemic of domestic violence we were facing in this city. When a young mother was shot in front of the police station, you were so important and your police were so important in trying to respond to all the mothers and children in this valley who were experiencing domestic violence. When we needed a needle exchange program in the city because they wouldn't have it in Holyoke and other places, I was asked by Leslie Lori to come with you down to uh, testify that we really needed a needle exchange program, and every police chief probably might have resisted that, but you supported us on that. And so, time and again, Russ, you have supported all of us here in this community, whether it's domestic violence or needle exchange, or the other issues we've faced. And so, it's very important to ask you to speak tonight, and to let you speak, and, and we, we do this with utmost respect. Kind of soft spoken, generally. Uh, and I, I do thank Robert Hives. I also thank Andrew uh, Lazian. Uh, they visited. Can you hear me? No. I think no. They came to my office to ask me to attend uh, this event today. It was still kind of in a, a rough state as to what exactly was going to happen. Uh, being the type of person I am, chief of police, I always prepare for worst case scenarios. So. <laughs> Literally hours went through my mind about what's it going to be, what I'm going to talk about, how, how can I be articulate and sound intelligent. And uh, Friday I sent out an email and said, I, I didn't hear from anybody. What's going on? Don't you want me to come anymore? So the past weekend I've thought a lot about what I might say here today. Uh, I mean, we're certainly pleased for the comments about the officers. My officers were so proud of the very ethical highly professional, uh, and not just in the large rally that happened, but in all the other rallies from the different organizations that come here for various incidents. Uh, we always pre-plan, our foremost thoughts are the protection of the marchers, uh, not only in traffic, but protection against some people that might have opposing views. Uh, 
from Arcadia that I'm staging the barricades, planning staffing. Uh, it's important for us to do that. And we also have the same amount of ultimate respect for the constitutional rights. If you're right of assembly, if you're right of free speech, uh, we work very hard to do that. We remain neutral. I want to preserve that ability for you to do this in our community. The department as it is today uh, was a little different when I became a police officer 37 years ago. Uh, my first event at an assembly was the first gay pride march. I came into work and I was handed a ride on it, a ride stick, and was told to go out there and keep the peace. When I was young, I scratched my head and I went, it's not the right way to do things. I came from a background college or pre-med, I was on a career path to go to medical school. I was an EMT for many years. And it's a long story how I became a cop, and a longer story how I became chief. But out of that, I learned one thing, that first, you do no harm when you have a job. You do no harm to the people that you're there to protect. <laughs> and over the years, as I ascended through the ranks, I became head of the detective bureau. I was the lead detective on the murder that Peter mentioned. Uh, the day Gene Osborne was shot in front of the station, I was no more than 40 feet away, and I was the first one on the scene. But tragic, tragic. Uh, and you learn from these events. When I took over as chief, proudly uh, was chosen 21 years ago this month. Uh, I wanted to do things different. We had a good department. I wanted it to be a great department. There were some obstacles that laid in our way. We were a city under the Commonwealth of Massachusetts had, had to hire police officers under the civil service system. That required a driver's license and a GED and nothing else. They had very uh, critical ways of how you hire the people. Uh, it was not working. I ended up getting appointed to a civil service reform commission at the state level, and it all fell on deaf ears. I knew I had to do something different. I started to lobby the mayor, the city council, and my union members as to we need to do something better. We need to get out of the civil service. We need to have a more consequential test that tests the skills and the abilities of the officers coming into the department. I also wanted to set up a threshold of not just a high school uh, GED and a driver's license, but for police officers being hired by Northampton Police to have a minimum of an associate's degree, and not just an associate's degree in criminal justice, we accept associate degrees for a broad range of psychological programs, sociological programs, these days computer information technology. I wanted bright people with a liberal arts background. I wanted people that had exposure uh, in their college settings to a broad range of people. Um, and we eventually, after almost 10 years, were able to pull that off. It actually took the act of the state of the legislature to release our DM from the state law for civil service to allow me to move ahead hire educated uh, police officers. Uh, at the same time, we're looking at the department that had decent rules and regulations, but certainly not anything resembling the best uh, police professional practices in the country. So over an eight-year period of time, we worked toward getting accredited. In 2002, we were the first city in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to reach accreditation level, a level now that we have maintained uh, since. Uh, so, to continue, again, the accreditation, it's, uh, if you've ever been associated with a university or a hospital, it's a very intensive review of your policies. We have over 267 mandatory and another 81 <coughs> optional policies that when the accreditation commission comes in, does a four-day review, they not only see that we have the policies written, but it's actually practiced. It carries a whole range of non-biased policing, community policing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So my officers live by the best professional police policies. Um, and further, there's just been many other initiatives that we've done. We concentrate a lot of times on the, uh, extended uh, specialized training for the officers. Uh, we encourage them to attend all kinds of different programs that come up. We're the first in the Commonwealth to adapt the, uh, what we call the mental health first aid. It's a 24-hour training for police officers. 
because of the high proportion of people uh, with needs in the community, emotionally disturbed people, uh, substance abusers. Uh, it's, it's really a, a big step in understanding and instead of just classically using a law enforcement tool and uh, arrest the, the person uh, to bring it to court, what the court worry about. We are collaboratively with a lot of agencies to uh, get these people early intervention, prevention, and be familiar with them. So it's a broad range of things that I could go on and on and on about. Uh, just about, again, the department I'm so proud of. Uh, it's made their mark in the community because many people tell me that. They're just highly professional people, uh, highly ethical people, and we hold them very, very accountable in all their actions. So uh, I'm glad to be here. I'm here to answer questions. When the question and answer period comes up, uh, it's my opportunity to listen to you all and also to help educate you with any questions that you might have about our department. Thank you. Thank you, Russ. David, you have enormous respect from the people of Western Massachusetts as district attorney. Um, you've responded to all the things that we've ever asked you to do. And although people said I have to get Andrea Basie to come with me in order to get you here too. Um, <laughs> so I um, and you've been to all the events today as well, and that's just your whole style in this in this um, Northeast District is you go to everything. You, you, you always are there at everything. You've been another leader here in the whole field of domestic violence and, and trying to work in multiple ways uh, to help women and children who are going through the experience of domestic violence. Uh, and so we're so grateful that you're here today. Um, I'm so grateful that you're our, our DA. And if Ferguson did happen here, we would all feel like we could at least come and talk to you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, I want to start with a, uh, the quote that you heard from Martin Luther King. And uh, it's a quote that I try to remember being in the justice system. Uh, Injustice anywhere is a threat justice everywhere. And that's why we're here today. Because we know that the injustices that happen outside uh, this bubble uh, of really progressive politics and caring uh, police chiefs um, does not always happen in other places. And so uh, Martin Luther King uh, wasn't just fighting for injustice in the South. He lived in Boston. He went to BU. You know, you know it was a much bigger issue than just Southern segregation. And so um, one of the ways that we can look at our justice system is that it's yours, it's not mine. And uh, whether it's Russ Senkowitz or Dave Sullivan or a judge, uh, it's you the people that hold us accountable. And that's why many of us live in the Pioneer Valley because um, it isn't just the H and Amherst that's silent. That's not sound, um, <laughs> but uh, it's the voice. And uh, what other part of the country, what other area would we have uh, two people who have different points of view um, sitting side by side? Uh, and maybe in our collective uh, sharing of wisdom and passion for justice that we learn, and I learn every day. The other quote that I'd like to give you was in the, uh, a book called The Pursuit of Justice, and it was Attorney General Robert Kennedy. He wrote the following. Every society gets the kind of criminal it deserves. What is equally true is that every community gets the kind of law enforcement it insists on. These words were written in 1964, and I think they still ring true today. Engaged citizens, must play a central role in addressing the social ills and problems by partnering with law enforcement. And without this true community engagement, law enforcement and prosecutors' offices cannot begin to address the complex problems of crime in our community. We have to understand and respond to the root causes of criminal behavior, or we are doomed to greater victimization of the innocent while bankrupting ourselves with the revolving door of arrests and incarceration 
that disproportionately incarcerates poor, black, brown, and white men in our society. What about the criminal we deserve? Or maybe we should look at it as the criminal our society creates. Let's start with childhood trauma. Do we really care about our kids? When I see a story about an abused dog, I hear, I feel, and I see more of a visceral response from that abuse of a dog than I do of a child. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say we shouldn't care about our animals, but let's put the kids on the top of the list. Substance abuse, alcohol, drugs. Let's look at that childhood trauma and what's creating that system of a revolving door of trauma and substance abuse. Our other area, untreated mental illness. Let's look at our society, materialism and greed, <laughs> income and inequality, racial and ethnic discrimination, intimate partner violence within families, in a culture of instant gratification and always wanting the magic pill. These factors have created a society in which we are criminalizing many of the behaviors that we as a society have created. Our approach towards substance abuse has been wrong. The public health crisis that we see with heroin and other lethal drugs is one that is a public health crisis. But we decided that we were going to incarcerate people rather than give them treatment on demand. And why can't we move toward treatment on demand the way that we move toward prison on demand? As a community, we gather here today and we need to challenge ourselves to do better as a society and a criminal justice system to address these social and economic injustices and the violence in our communities. That many of us think there isn't violence in Northampton or in Hampshire County, but there is. Most of it happens in our homes with domestic violence or child abuse, but we never hear or see it. We've had a breakdown in trust. Whether it's Ferguson, Staten Island, we've had that breakdown. We not only have to be a witness to our law enforcement justice system to do the right thing, we also have to build a society that perceives that they will do the right thing. And that perception is missing in many communities. There's a disconnection between police and community that can create the perfect storm of real and perceived injustice. We can do better. That includes me as the Chief Law Enforcement Official and District Attorney. We can do better in our hiring, our promotion, and addressing conscious and unconscious bias and prejudice in our ranks. Massachusetts for the hiring of police has done more than justice to racial equality in law enforcement ranks than anything I can see. When did answering a hundred questions right make you the right person for your community? The state police in Massachusetts have a bias. You get two points for being a veteran, but it's also a bias in civil service. That entity, our largest police force in Massachusetts, when I looked out at the graduation ranks, I was ashamed to say there were very few Asian Americans, very few African Americans, very few Latinos. That's our police force. We need to be enlightened enough to challenge that, and I will challenge the governor to change the way that we recruit our Mass State Police and our local police. Yeah. I believe we have a progressive police department here in Northampton.
believe that the chief made some courageous moves to get rid of civil service many years ago and to do his best at hiring people that reflect the folks in our community, gay, lesbian, Latino, African American. But we have to look in the mirror. Russ and I are white. We don't know what the black experience is. We don't know what the brown experience is. We don't know what the Asian American experience because we've never experienced it. And when you're in a position of power, you have to understand your shortcomings, you have to listen, you have to learn, and you have to try to make those radical moves and not so radical moves to make a quality a reality in your workplace and in the greater society. Community policing. We saw it in Ferguson. There's a disconnection in Ferguson between the community and the police department. Simply by looking at, out of 53 police officers, a white chief, four out of 53 police officers were white, in a community that was 67.4% African American. That is not reflective of their community. Therefore, the chance of that community accepting and embracing that police department and that police department embracing and respecting that community is difficult, if not impossible. Because there aren't enough people in those ranks that understand their community and can work with it on a day to day basis. It just doesn't happen in Ferguson. It's throughout our country. Our law enforcement needs to reflect our values, our vision for social and economic justice. Our law enforcement is your law enforcement. It isn't a distant place. It's yours. And you've demanded a lot here in Northampton. You've demanded a lot in Amherst. And I say, when I say something about law enforcement, I say we can do better. I balance this <coughs> with the fact that law enforcement has a very difficult job. And the question was, can Ferguson happen here? Yes. A young African American, Latino, or a white young man, unarmed, could be shot. We hope it doesn't, but it could be. It could be the case that that person is shot. It will be up to us to demand an independent and full review. It usually falls upon me as the district attorney to give that fair and impartial process. And if I don't feel that I can, I can ask the Attorney General. But I have to be accountable to justice. I can't be accountable to the media. And Ferguson was an example of how we wanted to all rush to judgment through initial media reports. Do I know the full truth of Ferguson? Absolutely not. Do any of us know that full truth? Yes. No. No, we don't. No, we don't. We weren't there. But what we do is we have to know that those institutions are fair, impartial, and just. And I don't think anybody has confidence in that Ferguson grand jury. Because did the district attorney put the scale, his thumb on the scales of impartiality? Many would say yes. We're now looking at a four minute mark. Okay. I, I hope it's not the content, but the time. But I want to tell you, looking at Ferguson, that the faith in the system was not there. And no matter what the result was, people weren't going to trust that result. And I'm not going to say, and I know I, I have some vocal voice to my right, that the individual who was initially victimized in that case was a person of color, the shot 
and there was a discharge of a firearm by a police officer. And I don't believe that we should not look at the full scope of what happened. The fact that he was unarmed. Okay. Why was he unarmed? All right, I'll answer questions later. Thank you. She is the Associate Professor of Anthropology and Archaeology at the University of Massachusetts. She is the brand new direction, director of the W.E.B. Du Bois Center at the University of Massachusetts. She and her husband Trevor uh, Baptiste were the keynote speakers at the Amherst Martin Luther King Day on Friday. Um, and on Saturday, and she's the mother of three adorable children. Yes. So good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Reclaim MLK. I'm gonna try that one more time. When I say it, you respond when I make a motion. Reclaim MLK. I'm glad I'm, I'm last. I'm going to bring it home for everybody. And, and, and allow us to, to, to walk into question and answer, maybe with just a different spirit right now. Okay? Um, I was charged with talking about what institutional racism is. And I think it's very important because there's, this, there's three kinds of racism that operate in the United States. There is individual, there is institutional, and there is systemic. The systemic racism that exists is the foundation that allows individual and institutional racism to keep going, okay? Now, yes, I'm an academic, but I'm not coming to talk to you as an academic. As you can see, I encourage, I'm not Cornell West yet, but I encourage the back and forth and the interactive because I want you to think as I'm speaking. Reclaim MLK. That systemic thing I want to talk about briefly. And I, before I start, before I do that, I want to say I'm not coming to you as an academic. I'm coming to you as the mother of three children who live in this community, two of which are black boys who will grow up to be black men. I don't feel the way I do about police at 43. I have, I look good for my age. Thank you very much. <laughs> at 43, that I did at 23, because I grew up in the era. I'm, and that's a nice way to put it, the era of Giuliani. Mm -hmm. Police brutality was erased by 9-11, but that's another panel. <laughs> but understand, I'm not coming to you because I have to raise my sons in a world where they have to, we have to navigate how they walk in the world. I don't think all police are the enemy. I'm off topic, institutional racism, systemic racism. I know I, I, get, I get charged up. I'm gonna tell you a quick little story. I'm an archeologist, so I believe in context, meaning an artifact means nothing without knowing what was found around it. Systemic violence, I'm gonna take y'all back a little bit. 1640, yeah, a lot. 1640, it's Massachusetts, y'all like old things, right? Yeah. <laughs> 1640, three men, indentured servants. Indentured servitude was the precursor to captivity of Africans. Really hardcore, you didn't get paid for what you did, you did and you had to actually pay back the person that paid your passage over here. So there was a guy named John, there was a guy named James, and there was a guy named Victor, all right? They ran away, they got caught. A guy named James and a guy named Victor had four more years put on their indenture. A guy by the name of John Punch was given life servitude. It was the first case of slavery in the United States. What did James have different than a guy named what did John have different than a guy named James and a guy named Victor? He was African. How is it 
that it is easy to find out if someone is running, escaping, they're marked by color. That was this situation in Virginia in the 1640s. Okay, so now I want to ask you, when you sit around your dinner table, do you talk about race and racism? A, never. B, sometimes. C, I don't have a choice. <laughs> Institutional racism operates, as the Reverend Ives, in every aspect of our lives. But that systemic, that system in which the United States of America moved from colony to nation was built on black and white. Obama is in office, but hey everybody, we are in a post-post-racial society. Let me tell you what that means, that's a new little term. Post-post-racial means stuff has gone all the way back. <laughs> Color blindness is a different kind of blindness, people. When my sons walk into a classroom, whether the teacher doesn't see color, they do, because they embody it. Understand that I'm not telling you that to be colorblind is not to try to see people as human beings, but understand that difference that marked John Punch in the 1640s is something that all of us that are of African descent live with every day and we can't help it. I could have 100 PhDs and be the director or whatever, but I bet you I still get followed in a store and so do We need to have conversations with our police. I live in a, a beautiful place called Pelham. Everything is good in Pelham. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to end because I don't, I, I, don't want, I don't want anybody calling out my four minutes. Because <laughs> I know it's up already. But, um, and I'm going to do this because I said I wasn't going to do it, but I am going to do it, especially because um, I, I had seen him in the audience. I want to quote a good friend of mine. He's a professor way down there at this other place called Hampshire College. Um, his name is Chris Tinson, Dr. Chris Tinson. And the question is, can Ferguson happen here? To me, the question is not about can Ferguson happen here. The question is, can the Ferguson movement shed light on what is happening here to change it? Ferguson draws attention to some of localized practices of suppression that have gone unaccounted or easily forgotten. The lessons of race and racism are still being learned 60 years after Brown and 50 years after Selma. This paradox, how society advances on some fronts while actively resisting fundamental changes on others is one that too few Americans are willing to admit much less engage. Check out Prof Professor Chris Tinson, he is awesome. So my last thought, sometimes, and I said this in my MLK uh, speech on Saturday, don't be afraid of Twitter. Don't be afraid of young people. The movement that happened in the 50s was young people. Elders. Find out what the movement is about. It's real. It's not just black. It's black. It's brown. It's white. It's from it's from Ferguson to uh, it's from Ferguson to Nigeria. It's from Ferguson to South Africa. It's from Ferguson to Palestine. It's from Ferguson to all over the world, where people's rights are trampled upon and people are complacent because we're comfortable in our lives. Believe in young people. Believe in the Ferguson movement, not just Ferguson, the Ferguson movement, because we're not going to stop till people are free. Thank you.
it's about 20 more minutes, and I want to call on four people to either make a comment or ask questions. And I want to start can with Jen. Can I make a real quick comment? Yeah, okay. This, um, I just, I just uh, as a North Hampton resident and a young black woman who's been arrested and stopped by police all over the country, um, also North Hampton, also Ferguson, um, I just want to quickly kind of... I just want to quickly kind of dispel a myth and just make one quick comment because I feel like there was this kind of uh, extended period of uh, praise and respect um, for the DA and the chief of police and, um, and this real idea that um, the police are doing their best to stop domestic violence and, and talking about do we care about our kids. Um, and I just want to say for the record for all of you that don't know that at all of our most recent marches, from Hadley to Springfield, um, immediately the state troopers and Hadley, Northampton, Springfield police respond with their dogs. So the footage that y'all saw in like Selma with the dogs, they haven't brought out water hoses, but they bring dogs to us. Um, so this like very nice extended language about like, for, like no, they bring dogs to us all the time. And I also just want to take this moment um, to tell y'all that um, <laughs> on Friday at eight o'clock, I have a court date in Holyoke, so you're welcome to join me there if you like. Thank you. Together for this conversation. Um, so, I guess one comment that I wanted to make is that, um, you know, as a person of color, I am really continue to be really deeply disturbed um, by this ongoing and consistent violence against people of color. And one of the, uh, what, what I believe to be um, one of the, uh, the causes of that, or a major contributor to that, is that we as people of color are not really seen. We are not seen in our full humanity. We are seen as stereotypes. You know, we are seen as one-dimensional. Um, and, uh, and, and I see what operates um, in these types of situations where uh, young men of color, um, unarmed men of color, are killed by police officers. And, and I was really uh, not surprised by this statistic, but I think it bears repeating, is that um, in this country, um, youth of color are fatally shot by police officers at 21 times mm. the rate of mm. white youth. There's mm. <laughs> risk of being shot. Yes, at risk of being shot. So, so anyway, that. So, so I feel like what we need to do is to really figure out what is to get underneath that deep fear that will motivate somebody in that um, in that instant to, to create this act of violence that will kill somebody of color. And I think it has to do with the fact that. Um, and, and I think someone on the panel mentioned that there is uh, conscious bias and unconscious bias. Mm -hmm. And I think that we really run the risk, uh, especially, you know, I'll say this, uh, if white people uh, take a look at their conscious bias and attempt to address it, and not take a look at the associations that are, are, are subconscious. Mm -hmm. Because we, we get these messages thrown at us from everywhere. You know, that people of color are inferior, uh, that people of color are to be feared. And unless that subconscious bias is addressed, I see that this can continue to happen. So my question, and the other thing that was mentioned a number of times, is that um, we need to raise up the narrative of Black Lives Matter. You know, that voices of people of color aren't being heard. Um, and I think that um, District Attorney Sullivan mentioned that he didn't know or didn't have a sense of what the experience is of, of um, people of color. So I want to know how are we going to do this uh, exchange where we can actually um, have opportunities for those voices to be heard and received and for some of this subconscious bias and association to be unearthed. So I don't know what the answer to that question is, but I wondered if you all had some thoughts about that. Ms. Officer Stats. you're talking about this fear is what our sister Whitney was just talking about and, and the systematic racism and what I think is the systematic um, white supremacy that, that goes hand in hand with how this country was founded. So it's a very deep kind of conversation and not something that's gonna change overnight. I think, um, <clears throat> And actually, I have another comment, and then I'll stop because I don't know how related it is, but 
Just in case, like, some of y'all don't know, like, this is not just about Mike Brown. This is about Bondi Myers Jr. and Tanisha Ford and Kenji May Powell. This is about Ayanna Jones. Um, this is about Antonio Martin, who was shot in Beverly, Missouri, which is the town neighboring Ferguson on the 23rd. Um, and so I have another statistic for you and for all of you, which is that every 28 hours in this country, um, a black person is killed by police or vigilantes. Um, and... Um, yeah, and I think that, you know, I think that especially when we have a majority white police force, but for me, um, I do not call the police when I have an emergency. I do not feel safe with police, and I don't feel more safe if it's a black or brown police officer um, who are actually often have internalized their own racism and can be even worse than some of these white officers. So I, I don't feel safe with a more black police force or more black women in the police force. That's not cutting it for me. Um, I want to know why the law is still upholding the fact that these people um, can shoot sometimes up to 17 times unarmed black youth every single day, um, and every week it seems we find a no charge of uh, no indictment, and the police are allowed to continue to police the police, um, so, and, and judges and DAs and everyone can kind of go in a corner and make sure that justice is not seen. Um, so. For me, if we're talking about systemic racism and systemic white supremacy, then we need a total systemic overhaul. So that's what I have. I would like to call on the next responder, um, who is Trevor Baptiste, who is the husband <laughs> of, um, of Whitney and the father of these three adorable children. And he's the uh, Chairperson of the Amherst School Committee. charged with giving them their instructions. 
if it can go unchecked, that a police chief can uh, uh, untangle themselves from the subservience of the city council, then not just black lives are in jeopardy, that's everybody's life in jeopardy. That's everybody's life in jeopardy. So I'll say the practical application of what it means to be seen by the system, valued by the system, and de facto change the system requires a vigilant eye by everyone, black people, brown people, white people, everyone who's a part of the system, to see when things are not told, things are not done, things are not encouraged and, uh, uh, for everybody. I don't mean to pick on you, Mr. Sullivan, but we just saw a blatant example of spinning facts that are unnecessary. It's up to, you know, some people in the system to figure out if a crime was done. Not to investigate the moral character of anybody who might have been a victim. You are right, Mr. Sullivan, we don't know anything that happened in that Ferguson case. But we don't know what happened in that uh, alleged robbery. That person didn't even file a report. For all we know, those could have been friends in a dispute of their own. It's irrelevant to the fact that a man was shot and killed on the street. The Those police, what are you doing? Are you doing what we expect you to do? Here in Northampton, our police must be overseen by yes. the Northampton uh, 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 City Council. It's up to them to say, police, are you doing what we expect you to do? Police don't get a chance to be autonomous and say to City Council, yeah. can't question. Uh, 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 district attorneys don't get a chance to say to the police, don't look at this, look at that. When black people, brown people don't have folks that can see that clearly, then protests and worse are expected and necessary to bring about change. Are expected and necessary to bring about change. Now, this is Dr. King said, and this is Dr. King said, I say, one of Dr. King's most radical. Um, 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 quotes that I'm fond of, of, of reciting is those that make nonviolent social change impossible, those that make it impossible, make violent social change inevitable. <laughs> None of us want that. All of us are fighting, struggling to figure out ways to nonviolently make sure that what must happen happens, and that is all of us have our say in the system we're all a part of. It becomes blinking when, when, when roadblocks are put up in our way. It, it, it can't be denied. And, and I just want to say, I wanted to say that. And I respect everyone on the panel. Thank you. I love Harry if you could either make a comment, ask a question, whatever you want to do. Sure. Can I grab that one, Peter? Turn right before, I just, I just want to um, do a, uh, one of my favorite Martin, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. quotes. Because um, it's, it's a quick one, um, and this is Reclaim MLK, it's a hashtag, don't be afraid of Twitter. Um, <laughs> law and order exist for the purpose of establishing justice, and when they fail in this purpose, they become the dangerously structured dams that block the flow of social progress. Well, uh, this is great to see everyone here today. So it's a, just a great turnout for this event. As Peter said, my name is Terry O'Toole. I work with the East Georgia Truth Memorial <coughs> Committee. Um, I want to thank all the panelists for being here today. And also, um, I need to acknowledge Bill Norris. Jeff Napolitano had mentioned him earlier. Uh, Bill was a member of our committee. He was an attorney here in Western Mass, and he passed away. Um, over the past year and so um, to be able to be here as a member of our committee and to know um, the types of things that, that Bill is passionate about um, really reinforces me so I'm appreciative for that. Some of you were able to go on our tour earlier today. It's a tour uh, African American Heritage Trail up in Florence. So we do the Dave Rubble Center. 
um, fantastic for you to learn about, uh, frankly, uh, some of the black history in this immediate community as well as some of the activist community uh, which existed here in Northampton in Florence. So I appreciate the educational value of the Sojourner Truth Memorial Committee and I, I'm really encouraged when we're able to um, help people learn about some of the story in the area. But another important part of our work um, is the high school social justice scholarship. So each year we have two the social justice scholarships that we give out to seniors in Hampshire County. And in addition to the students who receive those, one of the, the most important things for me is, is reading the applications of all of the students who apply. And through those applications, I think I get a snapshot, at least, of what some of the students in the Northampton, Amherst, Hadley communities are experiencing in, in the work that they're engaged in with various forms of, of racism, sexism, and, and various other kinds of prejudice. And that, bringing it to a very local level, we've had some great comments from the panel and from various people today about this conversation of, can Ferguson happen here? What are we talking about? Institutional racism, how, how do we want to frame that? But here on the local level, I think what everyone in the room knows is that we have these instances of racism within the immediate community. And what I want to ask the panel to, to just ask this, the question this way, to frame it very locally, if anyone on the, the panel would be willing um, to give examples of what they see immediately here in the North Hampton, <coughs> Amherst, Hadley, or even just Western Mass in general. What, are, what do you see as some of these um, instances of racism, and how do, we move, how do we move forward? What are some suggestions of things that people here in our immediate community um, can look at to try to move forward? So again, um, thank you uh, for having me here today, Peter. Thank you guys. I will just step aside and ask um, if someone on the, the panel will um, answer that question. There is somebody named Jonas who was attacked. Is that true? Um, I also know of friends who have been arrested for um, resisting arrest. Friends from our home, of black women um, who have been approached by the police for doing nothing, essentially, and being arrested for resisting arrest. My question would be, if these people, I'm sorry, if I owe you an arrangement, these people are, and they face all the general criminal charges? No, no, his question, not her reply to the question. Okay. Sorry, Jonas. It, it's a good question, because it's such a difficult subject. Uh, come with great hope, great expectations. Uh, that we're somehow going to figure out what to do or what the next step is. But it's there's so many different moving parts. The systemic racism that's talked about. It, you know, it's buried in the way our elected officials treat federal funding, our state officials, uh, the psychological, the social services. Have you experienced any racism here? Do you know any examples of racism that you would like to talk about? I was, have I had a personal experience? No, I did not. My best friend at Smith College was arrested for getting beat by her roommate by the Nepenthe police. Wow. She was beat? She was the, she, her roommate hit her, and when they came, they saw her as the aggressor. Her roommate was a white woman, and she's black. And she was arrested, and she stayed there overnight because she was the aggressor. And I think just as a quick follow-up to that, uh, Peter's, Reverend Ives started out um, speaking about his grandson and this idea of him being, uh, could his grandson be profiled and shot here in this immediate community? And building from that, trying to go a little more broadly to this question of racism in the immediate community, 
how do any of the panel members see that taking place here now? Yes, and I was trying to bring it to oh, a, okay. a point okay. where we were talking about systemic racism. It's not even before Ferguson, we looked at some of the sensitivity training that's offered for police officers. And I started reading about the research that some of this has a short shelf life. It might stick in their brain for a while. But there's a new area of research that talks about implicit racism that runs across different ethnic groups, different cultural groups. Everybody has a little bit. It depends what your life's experiences are. And I think there was even other science professor that was in some of the initial reports. But we're, we're looking into what kind of training that takes a different part of the brain as it describes it to deal with the implicit racism that people are born with, they develop through experience and through their, their, their personal contacts, social network. It early stage stuff, but it's that kind of progressive look outside the box, find out what's out there to make our people be better, be more sensitive, be more empathetic. And, and really. But while that training, while you're researching that training, what's the guarantee that your cops are not going to beat or incarcerate or kill us? Yeah. Oh. Stop shooting. If the DA could also respond to the question, I would really appreciate it. white people, the talk with your kids, choose you about sex. That's not my question. No. Let, 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 let me talk. Let me talk. Yeah, come on. With the African American community, the talk with your boys and young men is about staying alive. Yeah. That's profound. That touches me more than anything. When that was explained to me by several African American families, that had all. It really is about us and our view of the world and how it's shaped. Um, I have implicit racism. It's just the way it is. I was raised in a privileged white family, middle class. Those things that I grew up in my community, I have to address them. And I've tried my best throughout my life to do that. But I'm not going to be preaching to people uh, that I'm without sin, because as Andrea Bayesian knows, I am a sin. And part of the sin is our implicit interior view of the world that was shaped by white privilege. And um, I think it's important for me to always have self-reflection, and I think that everybody needs self-reflection, and in particular, those in power. And to go back to, I can be better as a district attorney, I can do better as the chief law enforcement official to make those messages to fellow law enforcement folks. And so um, I think that the most important thing for me today was listening to everybody here and uh, to listen to the fact that the world is not shaped by just white power and privilege. It's shaped by everybody. And that uh, we have to listen to each other and we have to respect each other.